Mohammed, I'll start with you. Do you want to explain? Is it working? Are you going to have my job to start by explaining the changes that Yaka has introduced? Well, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very honored to be here uh, today with this uh, elite audience. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I am very optimistic, very, very optimistic since uh, this uh, car car uh, announced two years ago. Uh, I am. We should, as a creation business company, support it because it's uh, helped us in our business. Uh, it is, uh, I think, postponed now for, I believe, for the next, at the end of the year. I don't know why. We were happy to, to uh, celebrate the starting of it, but uh, at least uh, change, a lot of changing is happening. And we can notice this. As I am air crew also, I'm flying BBJ and my company, I can see also the development in the airport because it's now uh, all going private uh, as Mr. Mike very mentioned in his uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of facilities now and it's coming. So in general, it's optimistic and very good. Oli, do you want to take us through the changes quickly? Um, yeah, I mean briefly, obviously I'm, uh, I'm operating aircraft in Saudi Arabia, I'm, I'm a lawyer so I'm familiar with the paper and uh, what the rules are, but actually uh, there is a gap between uh, how that actually translates in, into practice. Um, but the, the basic rules are, are that now if you're basing an aircraft in Saudi Arabia, you need to have it registered um, under a, uh, a GACA certificate, um, either a, a private operating certificate, uh, part 125, or uh, a full AOC operation uh, under part 121. Um, so really it's uh, an initiative to try and uh, improve the oversight that the, the national authority in Saudi has over uh, foreign registered aircraft that are, are based uh, and operated from Saudi Arabia. Yusuf, do you welcome it as well? Yeah, I, I agree with Oliver and Captain Mohammed. I think this has created uh, many good opportunities for Saudi operators in Saudi Arabia, especially NASJET. Um, you know, we are probably the first company to obtain a uh, Saudi commercial part 121 special unscheduled AOC which is basically replacing your 135 AOCs which is a commercial AOC. Um, we also recently renewed our 125 which as Oliver mentioned that's for non-commercial aircraft based in Saudi Arabia so so there is a big push I believe from GACA and from all the operators to regulate the business better to monitor the movement of the aircraft in and out of Saudi Arabia, and there is a lot of opportunity for operators such as NASA. So just to go back for people in the room who haven't been following it, I buy an aircraft, um, I register it in Aruba, but I base it in Saudi Arabia, and now the Saudi Arabia regulator wants oversight on that aircraft just because I've based it. How do you define basing an aircraft in Saudi Arabia? That's, that's a good question. I mean, I asked Gekka the same question as well, and uh, they said any aircraft that does not enter Saudi Arabia on a general declaration, and we all know what a gen dec means, that's uh, basically 72 hours on ground where the crew could enter without a visa as a general declaration. Um, any aircraft that's operated by a Saudi operator or owned by a Saudi entity, now they identify the entities of each aircraft down to the individual owner. As we know, aircraft are registered with special purpose companies. They're registered, uh, you know, around the world with different registries. But in, with GACA, to get an annual landing permit, which is your residency for that aircraft, you need to identify the individual owner. And if he is Saudi, automatically, and it's based there for more than three days out of the year, then they consider it based in Saudi Arabia. So, so you need to identify the ultimate beneficial owner of an SPV. Ollie, this seems very complicated. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the structures that, that are typically set up for aircraft ownership uh, do frequently make it very difficult to uh, identify who, who owns the aircraft. Um, and yeah, the legal owners can be different from the beneficial owners. And uh, you know, even beyond that, it can be a bit opaque. Um, so you know, the test of actually how long the aircraft is, is spending in, in Saudi Arabia is, is obviously a good way of uh, controlling. Um, the application of the rules. Um, 
I mean, it's interesting, you know, this, uh, the new regulations, um, the Saudi market is a very unique market. Um, the way it's developed is, is unique. It's, it's a very mature market in age terms, but it's not such a developed market uh, compared with some other markets in the region. Um, you know, the typical model of, of uh, you know, buying an aircraft, maybe 20, 30, 40 even years ago, uh, hiring some pilots, registering it in November, and then you know, operating it privately. Um, you know, that was, that's quite a classic model. Um, and there are a number of aircraft that, that have been operating in Saudi on that basis uh, for decades now. Those aircraft are, are getting older. Um, it's a big market, numbers-wise. It's, it's a very significant market. Um, and the need to try and, uh, it was a word Richard used earlier as well, harmonise uh, the oversight, uh, the regulatory oversight uh, of the aircraft that are based in Saudi Arabia that aren't necessarily registered in Saudi Arabia. Most private jets you know, based there aren't registered uh, locally. Um, it's become you know, more, more significant. Um, and uh, this is definitely a way of, of trying to harmonize. You, know, you can contrast the Saudi market with the UAE, which is probably a less mature in age terms market, but a more developed uh, market uh, in terms of the operational support, the maintenance support, uh, the FBOs you have here, uh, and the number of operators as well. Um, Saudi market, the way it's developed with family flight departments, it's very different, and uh, this is a a way of, of encouraging the next step, if you like, and, and a way of uh, helping to, to, to bring a, you know, a, I suppose, um, you know, there's some very professionally run flight departments, but helping to, to bring a broader oversight by GACA uh, to the fleet, which should, you know, should bring economies of scale, it should bring other benefits uh, and opportunities, uh, hopefully, to, 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 uh, to grow the fleet. You know, there are grey charter, you know, it's, it's been identified as an issue, um, particularly in Saudi Arabia, and uh, perhaps there should be uh, less scope for uh, illegal charter activity if there's closer oversight um, in relation to the fleet based in, in the kingdom. So that's a, a benefit, but there's a much bigger picture here about harmonization and, and uh, really uh, an effort to, to push the market uh, forwards, help it mature uh, in a way which would match actually the age of that market, which is which is quite uh, quite mature. Captain Mahano, was there a specific? I know you're not <laughs> representative GACA, you're regulated by them, but do you think there was a specific incident, or was it a growing frustration with GACA that led to them to introduce these rules? Do you know, what was the trigger? I think a uh, long time GACA did not revise the rules and regulations for a long time. Uh, since I think 2015, they start uh, to, uh, to uh, reshape their rules and regulations and we uh, noticed that even in the documentations. Uh, now, uh, before we were sending a file to get the pilot license and the aircraft uh, certificate, now it's online. It became online in, in, in the company, in the headquarters, we do it online. Uh, also, I think uh, maybe this, uh, uh, you know, the reforms now we are taking place in Saudi Arabia, everybody knows this. Uh, we became open market now. Uh, what I mean, a foreign investor before, he could not get any business in Saudi Arabia unless he has a, a Saudi partner. Now, it's not. You, any investor can go and invest in Saudi Arabia. I think also they were expecting uh, the uh, heavy uh, movement of uh, the business jet due to those mega projects announced in Saudi Arabia. New Red Sea project, uh, south of Riyadh, it means in city. Uh, I think today, uh, custodian for the Holy Mosque, King Salman, is, is putting the, uh, starting the project. I think they forecast this. And they need to, uh, to, to control all this movement because, uh, you know, we were having a lot of uh, aircraft owners. They work individually. And they can charter their aircraft, they can do whatever they want. Uh, I think all these reasons behind uh, GACA uh, pushing forward toward uh, this uh, regulations. Yeah. Uh, can, do you want me to answer the question? Go for it. Go for it. The, 
because I see this very uh, less percentage of uh, people. You, they can go to the website. It's very clear for I Kaka. Understand? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's very clear. It's crystal clear in the in the website, Kaka website. Yeah. I think that was at the start of the session before you guys started talking. I hope. Uh, Yusuf, can a non Saudi operator base and operate a foreign aircraft in Saudi? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, you know, if you, as Captain Mohammed mentioned, um, the rules and regulations are published online. There is a uh, section for Saudi operators, there's a section for non Saudi operators in the rules and regulations which apply to them. The Saudi operators that are based in Saudi Arabia um, for commercial operation follow 121 special and scheduled, which is 135. We also follow 125 for non-commercial aircraft. The non-Saudi operators can apply for an AOC, which is uh, 129 for commercial operations, or 127 for non-commercial operations. So there is that option available. Now, if you go to the GACRs recently, you'll see that 127 has been removed and they actually have it now saying reserved. So we don't know the reason behind that. Reserved doesn't mean that it's deleted. It could be reinstated down the road. So that will give an opportunity for, for foreign operators to come in and base their aircraft in Saudi Arabia. So if an aircraft is considered, only if an aircraft is considered based in Saudi, does it need to be on a uh, Saudi AOC or Saudi registered? Uh, right, right now, not yet. Um, but certainly the rules are um, yeah, designed to, to require uh, aircraft based in Saudi to be on a Saudi AOC or a, an operating certificate. Um, you know, the, the actual application of the rules has been pushed back and pushed back published back in 2016, it's supposed to become effective later that year, and you know, I think GACA is at risk of looking like the boy who cried wolf, and owners, you know, there is uncertainty, which is unhelpful for operators and owners actually, uh, as to when these rules will, will probably bite. Um, I think, you know, they will bite. Um, of course, you know, when they, they do uh, get applied, then you know, there are sometimes exceptions as well. We see it here in, in the UAE, um, you know, the, the, the black and white uh, law that the, 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 the GCAA here uh, publishes sometimes, you know, is, 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 uh, there's not always consistent application, but there's, there's probably reasons why. Uh, but certainly, you know, in Saudi Arabia, the requirement currently, we're told, will, will bite uh, come the end of, of this year. I imagine you know there are likely to be some exceptions. Potentially, it's the sort of market where uh, you do get exceptions. So, uh, but, but, but yeah, the answer is certainly imminently that will be a requirement. But philosophically, isn't the job of the registry registry to oversee the safety? You know, should a, you know if, if I've chosen to register with Bermuda. Isn't it all the Isle of Man? It's their job to make sure that that aircraft is safe and being operated. Should another country be getting involved? Look, I mean, uh, uh, we, we all know a year in the maintenance life of an aircraft is a, a very long time. Um, and if an annual inspection is required to renew the, the airworthiness, then, then you know a lot can happen in the meantime. Um, and you know there are other reasons. I mean, safety is important. Uh, we mentioned the great charter market earlier. Um, there, there are different angles on why it's important. Um, I don't think that um, you know these rules are necessarily uh, designed to attack you know offshore registrations as such, and, 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 and you know that's not uh, what will happen. It's it's just a question of look, you know, the market in Saudi Arabia is very mature. There are quite a lot of quite old aircraft um, now. You know, as I say, sort of 30, 40 years ago, some of these aircraft were being purchased and. and, and I think IATA identified a need, you know, it wasn't just the, the, the GACA, Saudi GACA, that uh, decided to, to try and uh, improve oversight. So it was also, you know, at an international level, there was uh, a perception that perhaps that fleet needed, you know, more supervision, uh, and that, you know, there was potentially an exposure, safety exposure, if, if, if something wasn't, uh, wasn't done to, to, to promote that. I think I can add to that as well. Um, as we mentioned, this 
don't quote me on this, but IATA did come in initially and audited the aviation authorities as that is their responsibility to do so. And what they found is the majority of the aircraft based in Saudi Arabia are not Saudi registered. They're registered in different countries around Saudi Arabia. And as we mentioned, and as Oliver mentioned, and you mentioned, they're done, uh, they, they do an annual inspection, that's it. The aviation authorities, they make it look good for them when they come in, they then pack their bags and go home, and then everything's back to normal business. So what was noticed by IATA is the aviation authorities have all these registries, Isle of Man, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, San Marino, you name it, based in Saudi Arabia, and nobody's really monitoring the movements of these aircraft. They're 365 days a year there. Okay, so they imposed on GACA to have more oversight because we had a lot of gray market. We had a lot of owners owning aircraft individually that maybe weren't following the rules. Okay, they want operators who are more proficient in running business to oversee the operation of these aircraft, okay? And they want people to, to uh, be safe. I think a lot of these gray market aircraft are being chartered that nobody knew about the condition where the pilot's being trained properly, where the record's being maintained properly, and so on. Now it falls on the hands of the operator to make sure that that process is secure. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because if a Saudi registered aircraft lands in France, and is based periodically in France, you're not going to expect the DGCA to take over the oversight. You know, is there a diplomatic, is there any pushback or? I don't think so. I think Saudi aircraft, we, we do have a Hotel Zulu, it's a G550, it's not managed by us, but it is based in London, okay, for an owner, a royal family member in Saudi Arabia. I remember this because we accepted the aircraft maybe about 15 years ago or 10 years ago or so. But, uh, uh, you know, they, we get audited all the time by the aviation authorities in France when we fly in the UK and so on. We follow their rules and regulations, okay. Um, GACA is starting to audit more aircraft in and out. Now, the benefit that I like about GACA versus the GCAA here is with GACA we have uh, something called Article 83 bids. Okay, which I'm sure we're going to get to, but is it on one of the questions? I didn't even realize somebody asked about it. Okay, see, it's good that we're, we're on the same page here. The Article 83 biz was signed between various aviation authorities, as we know, with GACA to allow GACA to oversee part of their operation. Okay, so they still have their part to do, which is the renewal of the C of A and the C of R, but for example, the validation of the pilots, where you used to go to Isle of Man to get a validation, or you used to go to Cayman Islands to get a validation, now you go to GACA. So they're right there, they're right next door. So um, what I like about Saudi Arabia is, or, or GACA in particular, is we have, I think, six or seven um, registries that have signed up on this Article 83 biz. Uh, Aruba Registry, I see them back here, San Marino, Cayman, um, uh, Bermuda signing up, I believe. Um, FAA uh, as well is working on something with GACA for the 125. Um, I'm hearing through the grapevine that they're signing an Article 83 biz as well with GACA. Don't quote me on it, but for the private registered or the private category aircraft, if you will. So, so that is a good question, and, and that gives more oversight to GACA locally. So, but the rules do apply to everyone regardless of the registry of the aircraft. So let's say if you had an Alpha 6 registered aircraft based in Saudi Arabia, the rules would still apply to them. And they would need to be on, a, for example, a private category. There's no Article 83 bits between GCAA and GACA right now, so it would be a private category aircraft. Do you expect one? That's another question. We, we would encourage it. I think our role with GACA and with the different aviation authorities, that we're very transparent with all of them. So I believe that uh, down the road, if we can get something going, it, it really falls back on GCAA because GACA are open to it. I don't know about the GCAA if they're open to it or not, but you know that would be something that uh, could be considered. And also, it's not a secret, but we have been approached by I think two or three owners of Alpha Six. Now we are negotiating with them, and this issue is on the table now to negotiate with GCAA to to uh, to uh, tackle this. Um, with all the positive, this is a question from the audience, with all the positive changes by GACA, are there any plans for making easier rules for flying direct to more airports in Captain Mohammed? Uh, 
I don't encourage this because I'm going to lose business, but uh, I will support GACA to prevent this. Um, does anyone want to comment on the citizen requirements for him? What do you mean by flying direct to more airports? I think it's, 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 it's GACA going to make it easier to fly into. I mean, it, it, all it depends on is their uh, customs immigration at that airport if it's arriving from an international destination. I mean, I don't see them imposing any restrictions on that. So I, I understand the question. It's operating a domestic flight, private. Does anyone want to ask that question? Um, what are the citizenship requirements for owning an aircraft or an AOC in Saudi? Uh, are they, do they have to be Saudi? Yeah, do you need to have 51% Saudi ownership for an AOC? Not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think to be consistent uh, with other jurisdictions, you'd have to have control uh, with, a Saudi, uh, with a Saudi citizen. Uh, and that's what would be relevant. Uh, that would be the case in other jurisdictions. So I'd expect it to be a requirement for Saudi control. I, 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 I'll be in the middle between both answers. I mean, uh, I believe that in the past, yes, but not anymore, as Captain Mehmet mentioned, that Saudi Arabia is trying to open up. And, you know, with uh, uh, our Crown Prince at the moment, you've seen his activity recently, you know, that they're trying to make a lot of change in Saudi Arabia, more change than what we can keep up with. But it's all positive change, in my opinion, and we're going to see a lot of uh, opportunities for foreign investors. That's his um, uh, slogan, if you will. He wants foreign investors to come in. So that, that rule will be eased, if you will, down the road. So. And do you know of any plans to develop maintenance capabilities, business jet maintenance? In no. Um, I, I mean, there are some maintenance facilities at the moment, but I think a lot of uh, pilots, they prefer to come into Dubai because they have more freedom. They can get a drink, they can enjoy life. I mean, there's a lot more activities in Dubai, as we know about. I mean, Saudi Arabia is, is nice. I mean, there are some MROs there. There, there is El Salam in Riyadh. There is a Saudi aerospace engineering that we've used in Jeddah before on our Gulf Streams. Um, Arabasco had a hangar there previously, but it's, it's currently just on hold at the moment. So, I mean, there is opportunities, I believe. And somebody mentioned in the previous panel discussion about uh, hangarage. Yes, that is a big concern for a lot of our owners, that if we could find an investor, and I think that's what GACA is looking for right now, to invest in hangars, or people who can build hangars and maintain them. I think that will be the success down the road. So that's one thing we are missing. So. Oli, do you see this spreading? Do you see other jurisdictions and middle countries following GACA? Look, I mean, I, I actually, you know, I said at the beginning, I think the Saudi market is a very unique market um, and, you know, lots of different ways. But one of the features of that market uh, is that, um, yeah, that it's, it's evolved in a way with lots of individual family flight departments, which has meant that there's a, an exposure in relation to safety regulation and because these aircraft are most often foreign registered, the oversight that uh, the, the, the GACA has um, is, is relatively limited. Um, and as those aircraft become much older, it's become more of an exposure. So I think it's, it's, it's probably uh, not needed elsewhere in the same way that it, it has been in, in Saudi Arabia. And, and um, yeah, the, the question of harmonization again, you know, really it's, it's uh, as you have said, you know, IAS was involved initially in, in, in identifying a potential issue here. Um, and, and it's a question of, it's consistent with a lot of different things happening in the kingdom. It's a question of uh, you know, really pushing that regulation, that level of oversight forwards uh, and bringing it in line with, with uh, you know, really to a level commensurate with the size and importance of that market in general aviation. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, final question for Yusuf and Captain Ahmed. This is all quite positive for you as a local operator, you know, but do you worry that some owners are going to go, I can't be bothered with this, I'm going to base my aircraft in Dubai, register it wherever I like, and charter out? That's a no. <laughs> 
you go first? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Everybody is looking for, I think, safety. Yeah. Uh, if I am an aircraft owner, I'm going to seek uh, the, the, the qualified company, and uh, it's good. I think it's it's healthy. Maybe it's more cost, but it's it's healthy and it's organizing the market. Yeah. You know, I, I've I've met a lot of owners as well in Saudi Arabia directly. These are direct owners, the beneficiary owners of the aircraft, and uh, they're all looking for to implement the solution. They're moving forward with it. They're not trying to push it aside, even though, as Captain Mohammed mentioned, uh, the deadline was postponed. It was supposed to be March 1st, 2018. They gave everybody a two-year notice for that. Now it's uh, postponed. The first upcoming deadline is May 1st, where all the operators and owners have to submit their intentions of what they're going to do, either go private or, or commercial. And then the full implementation date is now the end of the year, which is the 31st of December. So we're seeing a lot of operators and a lot of owners approach us for solutions. And I think it's it's positive because we're not here to work against anybody. We're here to work with them and support them on the new regulations. So, you know, um, that that's uh, one thing that, that overall with these private individuals who, as Oliver mentioned, used to have like private, privately run family businesses are now looking to other operators to provide that solution. Final question from the audience. Lobbying seems to be coming up a lot. Should, given the close political proximity between Saudi Arabia and the UAE, can we expect or should we push for more coordination between GACA and the Dubai CA? Uh, yes, I think it's good. And uh, uh, I think the relation also and the cooperation between uh, GACA and GC is, is an excellent. Uh, we as operator, we don't have any problem getting anything from uh, GCA, actually, yeah. Okay, Ali? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, naturally, and I think that it would be a, a good thing for both markets. Okay, let's end on an optimistic question. How optimistic are you for the Saudi business jet market in the next two years? Very, very optimistic. I, I agree with Captain Mohammed. We're going to see a lot of growth down the road, and we're in the right place at the right time. I mean, there's a lot of changes, even though relatively we've seen a slowdown, but you're going to see a big push forward. Yes. Two to five years, I think, I'll probably be more optimistic. But we'll see. Pushing that out. Oh, we've got a question here. Yeah, it's uh, Wasim from Bombardier. That was a very useful uh, discussion, and, but we didn't highlight an important part of this is Saudi Arabia is a probably in the Gulf GCC, 50% of the business. And what we're, we've missed out in this discussion is that the Saudiization of the business aviation. So by GACA doing so, in the past, the entire market was basically cabotaged or basically taken by Europe, or by UAE, by Qatar. So the charter business was completely given up for non-Saudi operators. Actually, the Saudi operators were non-existent. I mean, you had NAS living on you know, government projects, we had SPA, and maybe one more. So what we're seeing now is that this is opening a, a, an opportunity for newcomers, for you know, new operators in Saudi to come out and be able to make some money. And not only that, is the operational cost for any oper aircraft owner, owner in Saudi was extremely high because you're getting foreign pilots, rotation, nobody wants to live there. Now we're seeing so opportunity for small aircraft owners Learjet citations being was non-existent because you know your fixed cost would be like a million dollar. Now I've been seeing you know aircraft owners coming in you know with a CJ with a small Lear with Saudi pilots you know himself flying or having two Saudi pilots and his overhead cost is probably three four hundred thousand dollars. So that would promote business aviation dramatically and start probably opening a complete new uh, uh, you know a new business tier in the business. So I do hope it gets. Uh, it gets better. Thanks. Any more questions or comments? Brilliant. Thank you so much to the panelists.